Good morning, everyone. And on behalf of California Department of Veteran Affairs, I'd like to welcome you all to this presentation for Gulf War Illness. My name is Kirk Eller, and I am a CalTAP training coordinator here at CalVet, and I will be your facilitator for this presentation this morning. I'd like to begin with going over some housekeeping items. Um, we have all everyone's microphones and videos turned off. Uh, we would ask if any microphones or video cameras are enabled that you would please keep them off during this presentation to prevent any distractions for our guest speakers, as well as increasing our bandwidth so that it's no disruptions during the presentation. We have a great program for you today. Uh, I will be going over and covering some topics for the CalTAP program and hating on some of your California specific benefits. And then I will be passing it off to our Orange County network coordinator, our link coordinator, who is our local interagency network coordinator in the Orange County area, Ben Gales, and he will be covering his roles and responsibilities in that area. And then we have Michael Garza, an attorney for Bergman and Moore in law firm, and he will be going over the presumptive claims for Gulf War illness. At the end of this presentation, we will be conducting a virtual Q&A panel uh, to answer any of your questions during this event. Uh, speaking of the questions, uh, if you're not familiar with the Zoom, Zoom webinar, uh, if you locate the toolbar at the top bottom of the page, and if you open the Q&A tab, uh, we would ask that you please put and direct all questions to the Q&A tab. Uh, one of the CalTAP training managers, Alyssa Albright, will be addressing the Q&A tab during this presentation. Uh, we will be answering those questions either live or typing the, present, the answer back into the question and answer portion, but we will cover all of them at the end during the Q&A. So please be patient and we will get to your questions uh, as time allotted. And now I'd like to go over some of our CalTAP overview, uh, what the CalTAP program is. A little background on me, my name is Kirk Eller. Like I said, I am a Marine Corps veteran. I served from 1986 to 1990 as a helicopter crew chief. Uh, once I ex exited the military, I went into civil service and uh, went through the chapter 31 program uh, to get my college degree. And then I came on board for CalVet here in 2019. So what is the CalTAP program? Uh, the CalTAP program was actually designed to inform and connect veterans of all eras on what their earned federal and state benefits are, and then also provide continued support and assistance as those needs change over time. And how we do that is through five pathways. Uh, each of the pathways are the core curriculum, education, employment, entrepreneurship, and the fifth pathway for service providers who wanna provide services to veterans. Uh, this is our California Veterans Resource Book, a uh, snapshot of that. When you registered, you should have received a downloadable copy of this book. Uh, if you don't have a copy when you registered and received your link for this webinar, um, Alyssa will be putting this in the chat as well so that you can have access to it and download. She will also be posting a lot of resources in the chat, uh, which is why we highly recommend you to direct your questions to the Q&A tab so we don't get them mixed up or lose the questions. Uh, the Veteran Resource Book is there so that you can access it uh, to your advice. I highly recommend that you download it to your phone uh, or another electronic device and have it so that it's accessible to you throughout. And this is what our Veterans Resource Book looks like. Uh, on the back cover uh, of our resource is our 800 number uh, so that you can access CalTAP or CalVet at any time. And uh, we do pride ourselves on our 800 number for veteran services to where a live human being will answer that phone for you. So our CalTAP program on our front page of our CalVet page, our homepage, I should say, at calvet.ca.gov. You can see the icon where the laptop is. It's stated high CalTAP, it's highlighted. Uh, if you click on that link, that will take you to our CalTAP portal. Uh, at the bottom of the portal, there is an archives link for our previously recorded webinars. And uh, if you have any information or any resources that you would like to access from previous webinars, you would go to this link and you can see our previous recorded webinars. Also on our homepage, uh, I would like to mention since this is regarding claims and compensation and disability, on our homepage for CalVet, there is a link to VA claims, which gives you a lot of information and resources. Uh, if you click on that highlighted link there, that will take you here to the VA claims, which is a, a multitude of information and resources with downloadable links and well as access to many forms in filing a claim. 
I would like to highlight that if you do intend or if you have not already uh, intend on filing a disability compensation claim with the VA, uh, please use a accredited veteran service office to do that. And there is access and information on claims and representation that's highlighted here on this page. So how can you use CalTAP online? Uh, on our homepage at the CalTAP site where it's highlighted here, you click on that link. It will take you to the CalTAP portal. And I'm gonna highlight the core curriculum pathway here. And under the core curriculum pathway, there's various modules that are self-paced that you can scroll through and read information on topics such as healthcare. Uh, under module four, I have highlighted the claims and compensation module. Uh, this is uh, well access to information on how to file a claim with the VA. Under module five is your California specific benefits. Your California specific benefits throughout the state of California are as follows. In the book, they begin on chapter one in our veteran resource book. One of the most popular uh, resources here in California, we get calls about this all the time, is the college tuition fee waiver. Uh, if you have any questions about this, I recommend to put it in the chat and we'll cover it directly to you at the end. Uh, but what this is, is a uh, benefit for the veteran's dependents or possibly the spouse if you have a 100% service-connected disability rating. Uh, and this would waive any fees for tuition at any state-funded school, whether it's a UC, CSU, or a community college. Uh, it's a great benefit, and if you want more information, please put it in the chat or access it online at our website. Another program that's popular is our DMV programs. Uh, we allow uh, people to have access to have the veteran designation put on their driver's license, which is a huge benefit so that you don't have to carry around other valuable documents in your wallet to show that you are a veteran. Uh, we also have honoring veterans license plates, which can represent your unit or special interest, whether it's a gold star family, a Purple Heart recipient, uh, or Medal of Honor winner. Um, if you have the proper eligibility for a motor vehicle registration fee waiver, you can have your registration for one vehicle waived in the state of California as well. Other outdoor activities are very popular. Hunting and fishing license can have reduced fees as well as a no cost state park pass. Um, there is eligibility requirements for each of these. You can access them at their, their websites, which is uh, ca.wildlife.gov as well as state parks.gov. Our tax programs are popular. Uh, there's a disabled veteran property tax exemption, uh, as well as a business license tax exemption. I highly recommend that you contact your local county tax assessor's office to find out specifically which tax exemptions you may be eligible for. CalVet also has a Disabled Veteran Business Enterprise Program, or DVBE, and this DVBE program is actually a certification if you own a small business and you are a disabled veteran, you can certify that business to be able to contract and do business for goods and services with the state of California. The CalVet Home Loans is one, another one of our popular benefits for CalVet or CalVet Veterans of California. Uh, it provides excellent financing for veterans in a competitive market on interest rates. And you can also use your federal VA in conjunction with the CalVet loan so you can access a no money down or low money down uh, loan for your loan, home loan here in California. Our CalVet Women Veterans is a popular division here in Cal, or CalVet, and they provide information, advocacy, and outreach, as well as support to California women veterans. Uh, they also partner with the California Women Veterans Leadership Council, and you can sign up for a WIM annual statewide roster and receive emails on upcoming events, which is uh, very interesting because they have a Women's Veterans Annual Reception as well. Our CalVet Minority Veterans also provide information, advocacy, and outreach and support to California minority veterans. They can help and naturalize veterans in California with citizenship as well as naturalization services. This is what their webpage looks like, and they also have a statewide roster that you can sign up for uh, for information on upcoming events. Our CalVet homes are uh, excellent homes which care for our aging veterans. They have eight locations throughout the state of California. Uh, from Chula Vista all the way up to Redding and from Barstow uh, out west to Yauntville. We have three state cemeteries also. One, the first one is over in Seaside 
on the coast by Monterey, uh, another one up in Redding, and then the third one is attached to the Yachtville Veteran Home in the Napa Valley. Uh, the Yachtville Cemetery, you would need to be uh, eligible, um, a resident of the Yachtville Veterans Home to be interned in that cemetery. Some other common websites you should be familiar with are the va.gov. Uh, here you can access information from healthcare disability as well as education and records uh, or also filing a claim. Um, if you have any specific access or applying for those benefits, you can do that through the eBenefits portal. Here's where you would apply or manage any of your benefits. And if you have healthcare, you can go to My Health eVet, which is a great website to access your appointments or message your doctor, as well as access or upload health records and any pharmaceutical needs. So CalTAP would like to stay in support of you uh, and stay connected with you in many ways. And how we do that is if you could provide a non-DOD email to this uh, email address here, caltap at calvet.ca.gov. Uh, also, you can fill out today's webinar survey, which Alyssa will be posting in the chat at any time during this. Uh, we do encourage you to take this webinar or survey. Uh, we use that information and feedback to uh, uh, fine tune our webinars to tailor them to the needs of our veterans. You can also register on our homepage for My Cal Vet. Uh, if you register on that, you can filter out your needs as a veteran and what benefits you're looking to uh, get information about. You can also add us on Facebook uh, at CalVet Veteran Services, and you can attend webinars like this. So this is my contact information, my email here. There is a Facebook link there as well with a QR code. Uh, this is where you would go to like the Veteran Services Division, and this is the 800 number. Uh, that you can reach us uh, on the 800 and CalVet as well as the CalTAP portal. Please reach out to me if you have any questions about any of that California specific benefits. And now I'm going to turn it over to our local interagency network coordinator for Orange County, which is Ben Gales. Ben, thank you for joining us this morning. We appreciate your time. Okay, thanks so much, Kirk. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Gales, as Kirk said. I'm a CalVet and what we call a link. One of the most important jobs of a link is to provide information about benefits and services for veterans, service members, and their families. Uh, these days we're doing a lot of that by phone and email, and that's certainly a way that we can help you as well. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is our link map. Uh, the map is color coded, so you can see what link uh, can best serve you based on where you live. Um, our link regions differ a little bit based on size and veteran density. Uh, but one thing that's true for all of us as links is we have a solid understanding of the services in our regions and we're in a good position to connect you to them. Next slide, please. Okay, so what do we do as links? Uh, we provide outreach to service members, veterans, and their families. Uh, we make referrals and work directly with established service provider networks. So when we make referrals for you, we're not doing it because we read about uh, services on a website. We're doing it because we're out in the community. Uh, we know the organizations well, and we know many of the people that work there. Uh, so we're in a good position to make good referrals. Uh, we assist with local emergencies. A good example are the California wildfires. Our links are on-site at emergency centers, uh, helping veterans uh, connect with services to help them in those situations. And then we provide leadership and advocacy to local communities. So there's a lot of different collaborative organizations in the state and a lot of us do a lot of work to help improve the coordination and delivery of services through those collaboratives. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so connecting to benefits. So what kind of services can we connect you to? This is just a sampling. That's the first thing I wanna say. So in addition to what's here, there's a whole host of nonprofit organizations out there that provide a, a wide range of services. So we're just kind of giving you a sampling of what's out there. Um, so we're going to talk here about benefits that you can access anywhere in the state. So employment and training uh, through the Employment Development Department. Uh, they have staff that are veteran specific to help veterans uh, work to find employment. And those staff are located at what, at what are called America's Job Centers of California. You'll also often hear those referred to as one stops. Uh, California state benefits. Very good to know about county veteran service offices. So those, that's your gateway 
to, to learn information and apply for and get advocacy to access state and federal benefits. Uh, we certainly can talk to you about our full host of CalVet benefits, as Kirk talked about. And then in terms of healthcare, uh, we can connect you to VA medical centers and their clinics and vet centers, which are the VA's uh, mental health centers. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so that's it for me. Uh, just, to, just a brief presentation. You know, I think the most important point here today for me is just feel free to contact us. You know, that's why we're here as links. Again, that map can help you locate us. And we're used to talking to folks about a whole bunch of different stuff. So whatever your question is, just feel free to reach out to us. Thanks, Kirk. Thank you, Ben. We appreciate your time this morning for logging in. Uh, and like Ben said, if you have any questions, um, he is an excellent resource in the Orange County region uh, in the Southern California area. But also, if you have any questions regarding, he can link you to somebody, whether or not you're in the Orange County area as well. He has other connections throughout the state like he showed on the map. So now I would like to introduce Michael Garza, who is an attorney for the Bergman and Moore law firm. Uh, Michael is the director of programs and training at Bergman and Moore. Uh, he joined the firm in 2008 and he represents veterans before the Board of Veteran Appeals and the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. He's also an accredited service officer with several veteran service organizations, and he often travels throughout the country to deliver training on presentations on veterans law. Uh, Michael has a degree in history from Harvard University, uh, and he earned his law degree from the Georgetown University. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Michael Garza and his presentation on Gulf War Presumptive Claims. Thank you for joining us, Michael. Hello, good morning. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure to be here virtually. Um, it's a little different, but we've all adapted to the times as they are. Um, again, as Turk stated, we're going to be talking about the Gulf War presumptive claims. This is a fairly big topic of discussion. It comes up a lot, and I'll try to provide some clarity. Although, um, in a half hour, we'll do what we can. So this, uh, we'll start off, first of all, by talking about what is direct service connection. What's the general theory behind winning a service connection claim for, P for uh, any other condition, for example, PTSD, joint claims, et cetera, et cetera. Then from that, with that foundation, we'll move on to talking about the special presumption that Congress carved out for Gulf War veterans. Then finally, we'll end up talking about strategies that veterans and county service officers can work on when they meet to plan their claims and submit their claims to VA. Next slide, please. So first, we're going to talk about direct service connection. Uh, basically, a veteran must establish that a disability is service connected before they can begin to receive VA disability benefits and VA care. Uh, that's the foundation for every veteran getting benefits from VA, service connection. The three elements to establish what we generally call direct service connection are a present disability, an in-service incident or accident, or a nexus or a connection between the two. I'm gonna say nexus a lot, but nexus basically means a connection between two items. In this case, for a direct service connection, the veteran has to prove some kind of nexus between their present disability or whatever happened to them in service. In most circumstances, the veteran has to prove all three elements to win a claim. Next slide. So we're going to talk about the three separate elements briefly. For a present disability, the veteran must either have a medical diagnosis from a doctor of a disability, or if they don't have a diagnosis, they must have at least symptoms of a disability. They must have pain, headaches, uh, mental symptoms, something that suggests that there's a problem undergoing, uh, affecting the veteran, even if they haven't been diagnosed by a doctor with any specific disability. One thing to note, though, is that exposure alone is not a disability. The veteran must have a disability due to the exposure. And that relates to the uh, presentation today in that we have veterans who claim that they were exposed to certain chemicals, certain agents in the field of battle or in the theater of operations. But then that's all they say. They say, I want service connection for exposure. But VA only grants service connection for disabilities. The veteran must state what disability they have from that exposure. We'll go on to that in a few more slides. Next slide, please. So the second element is an in-service incident. The veteran must be able to trace their disability to some in-service incident or accident. This can be an accident, such as a motor vehicle accident, a training exercise accident, any kind of mishap that happened to the veteran in service where they suffered an injury. 
However, it can also be the general regular service. Veterans, and active duty service members, that is, carry out duties that the normal civilian population don't carry out. They perform rigorous exercises. They carry heavy rucksacks. They're exposed to loud noises. They're just exposed to hazards that the general population don't experience. And we call that the general rigors of service, which can suffice as the in-service incident. Beyond that, any other type of incident that resulted in a disability can be the in-service incident. For mental disability claims, usually it's something that happened psychically in service, some traumatic event or something that else that triggered a veteran's condition. One thing that handicaps a lot of veterans is that this in-service incident may not be documented. A lot of times they are documented, um, especially more recently, uh, the military is much better at documenting and maintaining medical files. But going back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, it could be a crapshoot as to whether or not VA actually kept, excuse me, to whether or not DOD, Department of Defense, actually was able to maintain the veterans file in a good condition. I'm sure a lot of you are aware of a, a 1972 fire at the National uh, personal archives destroy millions of veterans files um, that's a huge handicap so when that happens to a veteran when something isn't documented or the accident isn't documented they may have to go through other avenues to try to verify the incident next slide please so we talked about you now the first two elements the last is uh next slide please Yes, nexus. So again, the connection. The veteran has to prove a connection between their disability and service. And for most veterans, you know, the vast majority, this is where they lose their claims because the nexus evidence must come from a medical professional who has reviewed the veteran situation and provided a well-reasoned opinion. And in most cases, again, VA provides that opinion and many VA medical examiners offer opinions which are contrary to the veteran's expectations and beliefs. To counteract this, you know, the best case scenario is that a veteran can go to a private doctor on their own to get a medical opinion that supports their position. Unfortunately, that's not always possible. So veterans have to review the VA opinion carefully for mistakes. And that is in of itself a whole other topic for discussion, but we can't go into it. But VA examinations must be adequate. So that's something to watch out for when looking at VA examinations about a veteran's claim. Next slide. So now that we have that foundation of direct service connection, we're gonna move on to the special exemption that Congress carved out for Gulf War veterans. So again, you know, a veteran must have qualifying service and a qualifying health condition. That is the basis of a presumptive condition. And there's many that Congress has created. And what it does is, is, is it removes the need for a nexus. As long as the veteran has certain qualifying service, and then a qualifying health condition, there's no need to prove that there's a link medically between the two. Congress told VA, you must presumptively believe the veteran saying that these conditions are due to service. There's no need to prove a nexus. So that's the underlying theory of what a presumptive service connection condition is. Next slide. For the Gulf War, Congress has stated that VA will pay benefits to Persian Gulf War veterans who develop certain conditions. If you're really curious, there's the citation to the regulation there. Everything's available on publicly online for your own review. It's a hard regulation to read, so we're gonna try to distill it into a few minutes discussion here. But again, it's it's something that, uh, it's a topic that throws a lot of veterans and actually VA raiders and VA judges for a loop. It's not easy to understand. So basically, again, the veteran must have some qualifying service. They must have a qualifying disability. If a Gulf War veteran develops a qualifying disability, the veteran doesn't have to prove a nexus between the disability and service. VA grants service connection on a presumptive basis. Next slide. So the qualifying service is basically any location there shown in red in Southwest Asia. And Southwest Asia also includes the bodies of water listed in red and the airspace over those same areas. So basically, you know, the commonly understood theater of operations in the Southwest Theater Asia, the Southwest Asia Theater of Operation. One thing to note is that Afghanistan is not included in the general Gulf War presumption. You can see there it's separate. There's a thousand miles separating, you know, the two regions, 
although many of the hazards that veterans experience are the same, but it's not included in the general presumption we're going to talk about, but it is included in one of the presumptions that we'll talk about at the end. So basically, you're talking to veterans asking, you know, did they serve in one of these countries or did they fly over one of these countries or did they transit in any of those bodies of water? That is the qualifying service of this presumption. Next slide. Now, the time restriction. Basically, for this, there is no time restriction. As long as a veteran, well, first of all, the time restriction involves the theater of, involves the state of war. Basically, the Persian Gulf War started on August 2nd, 1990, going back to Desert Shield, I believe, and continues up to the day, up to the present, up to right now. All deployed Gulf War veterans benefit from VA's presumption. And that's something that throws a lot of veterans for a loop. You know, there's been, well, there was the 1990s action, then there was the lull there, then there started in 2003 uh, forward, there were various military operations. A lot of veterans, especially from the latter period, don't realize they benefit from the same presumption as the older veterans do. So that is the time period. And for the time period regarding the onset of the disability, the disability must become manifest to a degree of 10% or more before December 31st, 2026 for the veteran to benefit from the presumption. And Congress and VA keep pushing that deadline forward in time. Like VA just pushed that 2026 deadline a couple of days ago, actually, from 2021 to 0.5 years in the future. And we expect they'll keep doing that for the foreseeable future. I can't imagine that they'll stop um, pushing the deadline forward uh, for you know various political reasons and just for fairness for veterans. So basically, there's no time restriction for the veterans period of service or for the onset of the disability to at least 10% disabling. Next slide. Now, what are the qualifying conditions? This is where it gets tricky. In my mind, the uh, location of service, the period of service, the time of service, those are the easy parts to understand. Where it gets really tricky is the qualifying conditions. This is where it gets really excuse, hairy. So basically, VA will pay compensation of veterans who exhibit objective indications of a chronic qualifying disability. And just a quick side note here, I'm not going to look at the questions until the end of the presentation, and then I'll have the general Q&A where we'll talk about what you've all submitted for discussion there. Um, but I want to finish the presentation first. Um, but if something really intrigues you, put a pin in it and ask a question. I'll try to get to it at the end of the, pre at the presentation. So basically, VA will pay compensation to veterans who exhibit indications of a chronic qualifying disability. That's the key term, the chronic qualifying disability. Now, below that, there's two types of chronic qualifying disabilities. The first one is undiagnosed illness, which I'm going to call UDX from now on. UDX is undiagnosed illness. The second one is a tongue twister. It's a medically unexplained chronic multi-symptom illness, MUCMI. So there's basically two chronic qualifying disabilities under the Gulf War presumption. The first is UDX. The second is MUCMI. MUCMI is further defined by regulation to have three specific conditions, but it's not limited to those, but list three that are acknowledged right off the bat. There's chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and functional gastrointestinal disorders. Excuse me, functional gastrointestinal disorders. It's all tongue twisters uh, from here on. So basically, a MUCMI includes those three. It can include others. If a veteran comes to VA, they served in the Gulf War, they were deployed, they had a proper period of service with one of those three conditions, they must be presumptively granted service connection. That's how the presumption is supposed to work. It goes back to what we said earlier. You know, if a veteran comes to VA with one of these diagnoses, they don't need to prove a nexus. VA should be granting those presumptively. Next slide. The UDX and Muckamese are... Medical scientists, it's having trouble defining what those, what these are. VA regulation there try to provide guidance for what it thinks these conditions are by classifying them as symptom-based disabilities. And the regulation includes a list of signs and symptoms for both UDXs and MUCMEs. There's a, this is just a sample, fatigue, skin symptoms, headaches, muscle, joint pain, sleep disturbances, menstrual symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. And VA furthermore says that this list is not meant to be exhaustive. There could be symptoms not on the list of regulation, which could be signs of a UDX or a MUCMI. Next slide. 
So first we'll try to talk about undiagnosed illnesses, which is, which is difficult because regulations provide no additional guidance for what constitutes an undiagnosed illness. Mm -hmm. VA provides this definition you get service protection from undiagnosed illness, but then doesn't go the next step to say what exactly that is. If you see on the little graphic on the right hand side, there's just a list of possible symptoms. This is these are all gathered from the VA regulations describing possible symptoms of what may or may not be a UDX. And these claims are just in general hard to win because when a veteran goes to a doctor for their problems, doctors give diagnoses. Doctors have to give them for insurance purposes. They have to give them for treatment purposes, for uh, drug medication and things like that. And so once a veteran has a diagnosis, they no longer have an undiagnosed illness. And that's just, uh, it's a huge monkey wrench for veterans trying to win these types of claims of VA. But that being said, you know, it does happen. Um, this, this little graphic here is from a GAO analysis from a couple of years back. And they went through analyzing VA's practices with uh, Gulf War claims, and they found that some regional offices granted a lot of UDX claims, but it really did vary by RO. Some were very generous, some are very stingy. So it's not impossible to win UDX claims. It is just generally very difficult. You have to understand that right off the bat. Again, you know, once a veteran gets a diagnosis, then that typically tapes UDX off the table. Next slide. Muckamies are a bit easier to comprehend, even though they're still a bit, uh, besides being a tongue twister, it's a bit difficult medically conceptually to get your, to get your head around. Uh, basically, muckamy is a diagnosed illness without conclusive pathophysiology or etiology. It's one of those two words mean. Etiology is the cause of the disease. Pathophysiology are the bodily changes caused by the disease. So VA regulations state that if either the etiology or the pathophysiology are without conclusive you know, diagnosis or definition, then that might be a muckby. And that usually comes down to a medical opinion. Veterans can come to VA with many, many different condi conditions. Uh, some conditions just, we don't understand why, why they happen. We don't understand fully. Or other conditions, we don't understand how they actually affect the body. We don't understand how they cause the disease. Either of those conditions can be a muckamy, but again, that goes back to medical evidence. And there's a court case from 2018, again, saying that either of, if either of the etiology or the pathophysiology are not conclusive, then that disease can be a muckamy. Next slide. VA, however, does exclude some conditions from being a muckamy. Uh, so muckamies, uh, next slide. So yeah, chronic multi-symptom illnesses of partially understood etiology and pathophysiology are not considered medically unexplained. And VA specifically lists diabetes and multiple sclerosis, MS, as specific conditions that are not muckamies because we at least understand in some way how these conditions work, how they affect the body. That's not to say that a veteran can't win those types of claims. A veteran can't, the veteran can Go to VA saying that I have diabetes or MS due to some exposure uh, during my Gulf War service, but they just can't benefit from presumption. They'll have to go the direct service connection route to try to win, or there's other theories of entitlement that a veteran can take. But just be in mind that, you know, diabetes and MS are automatically not Gulf War presumptive conditions by regulation. Next slide. Now, we mentioned earlier that functional gastrointestinal disorders can be muckamies. And VA states that symptoms from the gastrointestinal tract, you know, the stomach going down to the bowels that are unexplained by any injury or disease can be a muckamy. However, the diagnosis must be made in accordance with medical principles. So again, this will go back to a veteran presenting with symptoms and a doctor verifying whether or not this is a muckamy. And if a doctor says it's a functional gastrointestinal disorder, something that comes up a lot is functional IBS. Irritable bowel system is considered a presumptive Gulf War condition under this, under this uh, definition here. Um, but then again, there are conditions that are automatically excluded. There's a 2018 court case where the veteran is trying to argue that GERD, 
uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is fairly common, uh, was a muckamy. And the court looked at the regulations, looked at the veterans' evidence, and decided that under the regulation, under the law, GERD cannot be a muckamy. A veteran can still win the GERD claim, but they can't try to take the Gulf War presumptive route to try to win that claim. Next slide. Now, the last, that's the, the, the last prong, the last group of Gulf War presumptive conditions are infectious diseases. And this is the class of diseases in which Afghanistan veterans are included from September 19, 2000 forward. Otherwise, Afghanistan veterans don't benefit from the other presumptions. An Afghanistan veteran can't come to VA with a UDX or a MUCBE claim because by law, Afghanistan is excluded from the presumptive area. But Congress does include Afghanistan in this infectious disease uh, part of the Gulf War presumption. I'm not gonna go through a lot of detail here. It's pretty straightforward. There's nine disease listed. They must be manifest to a degree of 10% or more within one year of separation from service. Uh, but some conditions do have long incubation periods, like malaria can have a long incubation period. Um, TB and that other one, which I can't pronounce, uh, have no time limit. And one thing, other thing to note is that if you look at the little graphic on the right-hand side of the screen there, a lot of these conditions have long lasting residuals. A veteran can suffer from these diseases and they can then suffer from ongoing symptoms over a long period of time. And the veterans can be, they, they should be granted service connection presumptively if they have a diagnosis of these conditions and they have the proper service uh, and the proper time period of service too. Uh, next slide. So fortunately, you know, that's the, due to the time, short time limit of this presentation. Um, that's as much as I can really say in this time frame. It's a topic that you can talk about for hours. Uh, I wish we could do that, maybe something scheduled in the future. Um, but all that being said, you know, a veteran can still argue that they have disability due to exposures in the Gulf War without, you know, having to rely on VA's presumptive conditions. Again, direct service connection for exposure is still possible and may be appropriate for conditions that VA does not list as presumptive. The veteran doesn't have a muckamy. They can't rely on the presumption, but they can argue, you know, direct service connection. And a lot of these rely on arguing that these conditions are due to toxic exposures. More evidence is coming out every year on the long-term effects of some of these exposures, burn pits, depleted uranium, um, oil, well fires, things like that. You know, just the environmental hazards of the area, you know, have had long-term effects on a lot of our veterans. Um, one thing that the veterans have to do is that they have to present arguments listing their conditions to those exposures. I can't just present, you know, general arguments. I was exposed to this in service. I should be granted service connection. They have to try to tailor their arguments to their, to their claim. And that includes excluding risk factors. For example, if a cancer is, if a cancer is normally linked to a high incidence of smoking, the veteran can say, well, I've never smoked. I don't have other risk factors for this cancer. It could be this in-service toxic exposure I had. That evidence is very useful to win the claim. But what a veteran will need at the end is an expert medical opinion. The veteran has to explain why their case is special, why their case doesn't match you know, the normal pattern of the civilian population. And you know the medical professional has to explain why that exposure is as least as likely as not the underlying cause of their condition. And that is... That's just the foundation of a good medical opinion. So again, just because a veteran can't win a presumptive condition claim because they don't have one of the presumptive conditions that doesn't exclude trying to argue every other possible theory of service connection. And direct service connection is usually the best route. But again, they typically will need a solid medical opinion to back up their arguments. Next slide. So now we've so just again, that's just a brief primer on a very big topic. So we'll just talk quickly about what, you know, how veterans and county service officers can prepare, you know, to put the veteran in the best position, the best position when they do come to talk, talk about filing their claim. Uh, basically, uh, sign up with, if you're a veteran, 
sign up with an accredited service officer. Find a uh, representation, find someone who's accredited. You can search online, I, I assume, to see if a person is accepted by that organization. Then after that, you know, you have to start identifying and gathering evidence. You know, what evidence do I have to back up my claim? Yeah, again, you have to prove the elements of service connection. You have to prove present disability, in-service incident, nexus. Well, if you're trying to file a presumptive claim, you know, what, what is your diagnosis? That's the most important thing. What diagnosis does the veteran have? Then after that, you know, submit the claims package using the correct VA forms. Submitting everything up front, all the evidence possible up front, getting a quick grant is by far the better strategy than stringing things out over years. The VA appeal process um, under the AMA is a bit faster now than it used to be, but I'm sure a lot of you uh, who are familiar with the legacy system are just used to claims and appeals lasting five, six, 10 years, which is untenable for many veterans who need access to VA healthcare and VA benefits. So submitting everything up front, you know, trying to get the quick win is by far the better strategy. Next slide. So we're just to talk over a few forms here very quickly. The power of attorney is a basic form that a veteran needs to submit to give an individual or an organization access to their claims file and the right to represent them before a VA. And basically, or service organizations won't st even start to help a veteran until they have that, uh, in this case, the VA Form 21-22 in hand. Uh, basically, you know, I'm not going to talk through all the boxes here. Start with the veteran's information in the first boxes. Then box 15 is the name of the service organization. And box 16 is for the individual rep's name. VA does like to have that on file. Next slide. Now, the interview between the veterans and service officers, you know, that has a couple of different purposes. You know, you're sure if you're a service officer, you've done this thousands of times, so I'm not telling you anything new. But maybe if you're a veteran, you know, you're not sure what's going to happen, you need a little bit of anxiety. Basically, the service officer should be explaining VA's rules and procedures. Again, they should be explaining what you need to do to win your claim. The service officer can hopefully also assess the strength of your claim. They can point out the weaknesses, like you need more evidence here, we need these documents here, we need this and that. So a good service officer can explain what you need to do more to win the claim. Now, obviously, you want to find someone that you work well with, um, although it's not necessary. I've had clients that I didn't necessarily gel with entirely, but we had you know, good business relationships. But at least you know, being friendly, being cordial is the basis for any good relationship um, and a foundation for moving forward from there. And after that, you know, you want to plan the next steps. So you have a strategy to win a claim. You know, what do we need to do now? What evidence do we need to do? Can we talk to a doctor? Can we talk to family members? Things like that. And obviously, service officers should be setting reasonable expectations. They should be knowledgeable at least about VA's rating schedule. They should be telling you that you have disabilities beyond what you're thinking of that, you know, may be eligible for service connection. And one thing that many service officers do, which is invaluable, is prepping veterans for CUP examinations. Again, VA requires examinations of veterans for various purposes. They're not pleasant, no one likes them, but they're just a fact of the system. And dealing with it and cooperating with VA is probably one of the best things v the veteran can do for these situations. Next slide. So this goes back to, you know, talking, excuse me, about go for claims. You know, you want to identify all the relevant information for a veteran situation. Where were they deployed? What were the dates of deployment? And beyond that, what exposure did the veteran experience? Were there burn pits on the base? Were there burn pits in that forward operating base? Just documents, documentation of that kind of exposure can go a long way toward winning, you know, if not a presumptive claim, then a direct service connection claim. Uh, by showing that a veteran was exposed to certain conditions. And we, we're aware that VA did create some new presumptions for some new burn pit conditions, which we'll be talking about next week. So I'm not going to go into detail about that. But there's a new presumption created for burn pit exposure for certain conditions. Uh, but preview, we'll talk about that next week. Uh, so tune in then. Uh, beyond that, proving exposure, VA generally accepts a veteran's late statement if it's consistent with the circumstances of the exposure. VA is generally accepting that every veteran was exposed to burn pits, but if a veteran has pictures, you know, that's great. Submit those. Like, here's a burn pit on base. The smoke landed on my bunk, you know, it was in my food. But the matter was all over the base. It, was infected. it, it affected everyone. So that kind of evidence can be helpful. Uh, beyond that, you know, what are their veterans' current conditions? What diagnoses do they have from a doctor? 
And beyond that, you know, what are their symptoms? What other problems do they have? Service officers may talk to a veteran about, you know, how are you feeling otherwise, you know, and they're not doing it to be nosy. They're trying to find out, you know, what other possible problems do you have that may be due to service? And it's, uh, it's because they have a better understanding of what conditions VA might consider for service connection. And beyond that, you know, the third, one of the third things to talk about is to talk about, you know, your treatment history. They'll ask, you know, where are you getting treated? Are you going to be a hospital? Are you going to a private doctor? They'll try to elicit information on your history of treatment because the evidence from those medical providers may be crucial to winning the claim. And if a claim is won, to then establishing the disability rating, which affects compensation and your group level at VA hospitals. Um, what do we always encourage VSOs to do is always ask about other presumptive conditions. Uh, Golf War presumption is just one, but being aware that other presumptive conditions, such as chronic conditions, things like that, can help the veteran win additional benefits. Next slide. So once you've done all that, you know, it's a lot of work, but, you know, putting in the, the footwork to start off with will give you a good foundation to winning more quickly, uh, preparing your VA claim package. Uh, start with the VA form 21-526-EZ. That is the basic VA claim form. Then if there's private medical records, submit uh, private, uh, either submit the records yourself if you collect them, or you can ask VA to help you collect them on your behalf. And you have to submit releases. If you have lay statements to submit, such as statements in support of claim, submit those, witness statements, other evidence. And one thing that a lot of people neglect is submitting arguments. Like I have this condition, this is why I think it's due to service. Many veterans submit what we call naked claims. They just send in evidence, but don't say why they think the evidence helps their claim. If you can provide at least a basic argument, you know, this is my service connection argument claim. This is my condition. This will happen to me in service. This is why I think it's related to service. You know, you're getting a leg up on other veterans who haven't submitted those types of arguments and moving your claim along faster and making it easier, hopefully, for VA to win the claim. Next slide. So uh, just briefly talking about the uh, 21526EZ, uh, VA now has a claim form regime where if you're not submitting claims in the proper form, they'll kick it back to you until you use a proper form. They may or may not tell you what that is, but just generally if a veteran is submitting a claim for a certain disability for the first time, use the 526EZ. If they've never submitted a disability for that, excuse me, if they never submitted a claim for that disability, you're using the 526EZ. Now, the 526EZ does have box four there, where if a veteran has ever filed a claim before, they should be uh, checking that and putting their social security number down so VA can link that claim to their file in their in their computer database. But again, 526EZ is a claim form to use if a veteran has never filed a claim for that condition before. Next slide. So moving on on the 526EZ, section four is where the veteran can put in the information regarding the claims. For each claim, again, list the disability, list the in-service event, and try to list you know, how you think that disability is related to service. And the final box there is approximate date disability began or worsen. So basically this is filling in the rudiments of a direct service connection argument. You're trying to put, you know, disability in service event, nexus. Now there's not a lot of space there. So you can use additional forms of, to round out, you know, uh, the information because again, VA just doesn't provide a lot of space to write down or type down information on these forms here. Uh, box 17 is where the veteran can list all the VA or DOD facilities where they get medical treatment. Uh, so VA has an obligation to collect those once they're pointed out. Uh, best practice is to include the date of treatment. Uh, so VA can narrow down the search window for those records. Next slide. For private medical records, VA will help the veteran collect those. The veteran has to submit the 21-4142A. For this, make sure the veteran includes the doctor facility name and the dates of treatment, and always include prior treatment and relevant primary care providers. Um, veterans can find and submit these records themselves directly. A hang up though is that a lot of doctors ask for money for those records. But if they get a request from VA, VA says upfront, we can't pay. 
So many providers provide the records for free at that point. So that's why asking VA to collect those records might be the best choice. And again, medical records will establish diagnoses. It will show courses of treatment. The doctor may write in the veteran statements about when the condition began. Uh, doctors may even write nexus opinions, like this might be due to X in service or something like that. So that could help a veteran with their claim. Next slide. So we mentioned earlier, you know, attaching additional forms. For that, always use a 214138. Uh, we always advise veterans to submit this form with every claim, with additional information, additional statements, additional arguments. It's basically the blank form that a veteran should be using to tell VA why I think I'm entitled to this benefit. Best practice, we think, is including the veteran's name, social security number, and date on every page, and also number every page, page 104, 204, 304, for example, to make sure VA can ensure they have a complete record of the veteran statements. You don't want VA looking at an incomplete record because they lost something that you sent them. Make sure you know that you can review the file, especially for service officers, to see that the veteran submissions are uh, included in their entirety. Again, don't submit naked claims. Don't just send evidence without any argument. You want to tell VA why you think you should win the claim. Next slide. After that, you no, know, you're in the you're in the hamster wheel of the VA adjudication system. We always suggest that veterans remain in at least you know somewhat regular contact with their service officers to keep them up to date on any letters they may receive from VA if they have any questions and. One thing that service officers can do is if they have access to VBMS file, they can be checking the veteran's record to see that records are being collected for the veteran. They can double check the records with the 4142A or the 5260Z to see if anything's not being collected. They can also keep the veteran appraised of when a CMP examination may be scheduled. Or if the veteran gets a letter uh, saying that a CMP examination has been scheduled, can, can contact their service officer to let them know. And then, you know, service officer can hopefully provide good advice on how to proceed with that. Once the rating decision comes out, you know, service officer should be available to answer questions. What does this mean? Did I win? Did I lose? What's my rating? How much do I get paid? Things like that. And after that, you know, keep in touch if your condition gets worsened. If you're granted service connection for a condition and, you know, a couple of years down the line, your condition gets worse, or you can file an increased rating claim as a veteran for higher disability compensation. And, you know, always keep the service officer, you know, praised of a million address, change in dependents, and, you know, VA too, because that can affect the veteran's level of, of compensation and their additional benefits. Now, we all, this is the best case scenario, that veteran submits a claim, they win, that's it, they're happy, and the VA and them part their ways. But unfortunately, it's not like that most of the time. VA may deny part or all the claim. And at that point in time, veterans can appeal, they can dispute the decision. And that starts a whole other process in the VA adjudication system. And that's something where we think service officers should definitely be contacted to discuss strategies on how to proceed with disputes. Next slide. Just a few additional forms here uh, before we wrap up. VHA enrollment forms to get into the VA healthcare system. Uh, that includes any VHA medical center. They're all over the country. They're pretty highly rated. The problem is getting access to them. Um, that's that's where veterans, you know, fall to their cracks. They just can't get access to VHA. But once they're in, most are happy with the care they receive there. The 1010 easy is the form to use. There's questions about the veteran service history, disability ratings, and income. And this is all used to determine the veterans' eligibility class, their group class for uh, access to healthcare and drug prescription copays, things like that. Next slide. So that does wrap up the presentation, actually. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to talk about this topic. It's something that's close to a lot of advocates' hearts. It's such a big area, which VA doesn't explain very well. Um, but hopefully this provided at least some guidance, gave you some clues on how to proceed. And now uh, we'll look at some of the questions here and try to uh, discuss some of your concerns. Thank you, Michael. Our, we appreciate your time. That was a lot of very good information. Uh, we do have about 30 questions in the Q&A tab. I, I would like to highlight, if you do have a question, please um, uh, 
abstain from putting it in the chat so we can keep an itemized list of the questions. If you could direct your question to the Q&A tab and not the chat so we can keep them kind of segregated and that way we don't miss any questions. We will try to answer the questions in the chat as best we can. Uh, but let's go back to the Q&A tab from the very beginning. I think the first one was uh, about 100% disability rating. Uh, do I qualify for a vehicle license plate? Yes. Uh, if you do have a 100% service-connected disability rating from the VA uh, and you have mobility issues that require you to have a handicap placard, you will have qualification for having your registration fees waived as well. Uh, you can access that information on our website under the DMV uh, tab under our CalTAP California Benefits, uh, or you can also email us at CalTAP at calvet.ca and we can provide you specific information for that. The next question was, uh, can you be emailed a PowerPoint? We have posted this email, the PowerPoint slide presentation in a PDF format several times in the chat format. Uh, and you can also access this at a later time. We are recording this webinar. Uh, on our archived webinars, our communications department will be posting this uh, at a later date for future access. Uh, next question, uh, from 10 years from service separation for Gulf War syndrome. Um, I think this was a reply to a previous question, I believe. I'm not quite sure about that. Yeah, there's no limitation to when the condition has its onset. Okay. Um, it, must be man it must manifest at least 10% disabling. There must okay. be some symptoms affecting the veteran. But from the veteran, you know, the day they left service to again congress keep pushing the date forward in time um yeah as long as, as long as during that time period you can win a service connection presumptive claim for gulf war presumptions great thank you michael okay the next question is uh when did presumptive info begin and uh th this person was told that they need a nexus letter for their conditions uh presumptive info began uh we have a whole uh, the, the full version of this of this lesson has like the history of the presumption. It started, Congress started hearing about this, you know, soon after veterans started returning. And uh, like Paul Selvin with our firm was one, actually was a, uh, one of the advocates for veterans at that time. But, you know, the presumption has been expanded over time. Right now, you know, we're working behind the scenes to get things added to the presumption. But it's been an ongoing development since the first Gulf War. And what was the second point in that second part of the question? Um, it was, um, they need a nexus letter. They were told that they need a nexus letter. Well, it depends. You know, if you have a MUCMI or UDX, you shouldn't need a nexus letter. Okay. But if they're coming to VA with a condition other than those, they're going to ask for a nexus letter. But again, if you have fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, or functional gastrointestinal disorder, tell VA, no, these are presumptive conditions. I serve in the Gulf. You should just grant this. Okay. Excellent question. Uh, the next one uh, is an 80% service-connected disability, uh, told they should leave it alone because I am 100% with unemployability, uh, but I qualify for this. Should I reapply for with this? Oh, just, uh, yeah, I've seen that a lot. You know, just, it depends up to you. 100% yeah. vet, received veterans can start gaining things like SMC, you know, higher levels of disability, but do you want to go through the whole process again? And right. Do you want to take the chance that VA may lower your rating downgrade yes. yeah if some exactly. clever doctor finds oh you're getting better they make yeah. sure well lower you in your rating you know but right. you know, if they carefully talk to your service officer in more detail what exactly are you looking for like what more do you want from va excellent answer okay next question uh this person was in service and they have asthma other allergy issues and they get injections once a week, can this be a link to his time and service in Iraq? Luckily, that is a new presumption. Um, those conditions are now presumptively related to particulate matter exposure. Watch next week for that presentation. But yes, those are now presumptive conditions. Other another, it's not the goal for presumption. It's another presumption Congress has created. But okay, next great. week, yeah, you can watch it for that. And and also, there was a couple of questions in the chat about the uh, link for our upcoming webinar, which is next week on uh, burn pits. Um, if you go to our web, our Eventbrite page, you can see all of our upcoming webinars and also the link for our archived webinars have upcoming as well. So thank you for that question. 
The next one, is there a list of presumptive conditions that have been approved by Congress? I think you've already addressed that in your presentation. It's, you? it's on the regulation. It's, yes. it, it's, yeah, I need to know more to answer what you're trying to find. But yeah, everything's okay. a list of regulation. I can't give you the list right now, unfortunately. It's just beyond Perfect. the scope of this. Okay, must a veteran have a representative to file a PTSD for sleep apnea? Technically, you don't need representation. You can do it on your own. Yeah. Uh, but as always, you recommend. And I'm it's sure encouraged. Kirk, yeah, Kirk here will recommend getting a representation. They'll just sure. help you navigate the system. Yeah. Plus, it's nice in case there is an appeal process that, so that you have that uh, qualified person as an advocate on your behalf. So that's why it's really important to have a qualified, uh, accredited representative file your claim for you. Okay, the next, uh, the copy of the slides, uh, we've addressed that several times. Uh, this one is to fulfill the requirement for chronicity. The claimed illness must have persisted for a period of six months. Uh, this six-month period of chronicity is measured from the earliest date on which all pertinent evidence establishes that the signs or symptoms of the disability first became manifested. Service connection for IBS is denied since the disability neither arose during service in the Gulf War I'm theater. guessing that this is cut and paste from a rain decision. Yeah, it That's looks what like it is. Okay. So the first section there is from a regulation offering, you know, this is what we think a muckamy is. VA offered a bunch of regulations trying to offer guidance to what muckamies are, but they just screwed it up. It's, uh, they, it's in the regulation. You can't ignore it, but they're relying on that passage to say this veteran doesn't have IBS or that the IBS isn't manifest to a compensable degree. So therefore, it's not a presumptive condition. Okay. Um, that would really, to, that'd be something to dispute. I mean, you have to look at the facts of the case to say, you know, you should be doing this. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Uh, the next one is I had an incident and di undiagnosed illness brought to the DAV representative. Nothing was done as a claim. What can I do? Yeah, that's a tough one. There's not much I can say. You know, if you're a service officer, you're always free to move service officers. If you don't gel with someone or if you find mm -hmm. they're not working as diligently or um, as well as you think they should. But keep right. in mind that service officers are very busy too. Sure. And may, they may have advised that this was not a valid claim or I don't know what happened there, but you're always free to file a claim on your own or to reach out to VA and say, I think I filed this claim. Was there any action on it? Great answer. Okay, next uh, question, uh, fibromyalgia. Uh, part of that is brain fog. Uh, Yes, basically, yes. If your, fibromy if your fibromyalgia causes you to fall down and break a leg or injure a joint, that will be a secondary condition to the service connect condition. That can be service connected by VA. Great. Okay. Hypochondriac, due to many of these symptoms that stump their doctor. Again, that's another tough one. That's uh, without knowing the full facts of the case. I mean, I don't want to give advice on. I don't want to give advice on a person's individual case here. There's right. More general questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, this was medical evidence. So yeah, this is more from a rain decision here. So again, this is a new presumptive condition. Rhinitis is one of those new presumptive conditions. So revisit that with the veteran to see if they serve. Did they have? that exposure, burp exposure, and do they have one of the new percent conditions? So yeah, tune in next week. Okay. Um, 30% disabled uh, IBS, chronic Crohn's, presumptively qualified for, based on that, I see about increasing, what should his next step be? Oh, so this is your race service connected. You're looking yeah. at, thinking about, um, the best thing to do is if you have access to internet, you can find the diagnostic code used to rate IBS and see if your symptoms start to match up with the next higher rating. If mm -hmm. you're getting the sense they do, that's when to file it. Or, you know, if you just want, if you just want an examination to see if you qualify for higher rating, you know, I file an increased rating claim. Great answer. Thank you, Michael. Okay, next one. Uh, retired in 2008, haven't used any VA college benefit. Understand there's a time limit. Um, has that changed or will it change in the future? Um, it has changed um, after 2013, our, which uh, you would be under the post 9-11 GI Bill after 2001. So you would have a 15 year limit from 2008 up until 
2013. After 2013, it's now considered the forever GI Bill. Uh, so you would have a 15 year limit on when you would be able to use that uh, GI benefit. Um, you can access any of that GI Bill at uh, the hotline, the 1-800-GI Bill. Um, and you can ask any questions about how much benefit you have. They would look up your information and can tell you when it's gonna be uh, coming due or how much you have left, how much you've used. Uh, so, or you can call us or email us at our contact information. Okay, um, this one is directed to you, Michael, about the, the do you work or take clients on for filing claims specifically? Um, contact, uh, we'll have contact information for Paul Sullivan, mm -hmm. who's our director of outreach. But generally speaking, private law firms don't take on clients for initial filing the claims. We take it in clients after a dispute has been taken on. And that's basically because Congress says we can't collect fees until right. there's a dispute. I mean, that's, you know, we, we, we have family support, so we do need to, to get paid for the work we do. And that's the rationale for that. Okay. Hopefully that answered the question. Um, they were denied claim for service connected disability provided medical records with diagnosis. Uh, my illnesses are now considered presumptive. Do I just file an appeal? Well, it depends, That's on, a good it, question. It depends on when you were denied. If you were denied for that condition more than a year ago, the appeal period has run out. So you have to start a new claim. Okay. If you're within that one year period, you can submit the appeal. But again, the, I'd probably suggest talking to a service officer uh, who can access your VBMS file to double check, you know, the time, the time frame we're looking at here. But yeah, you can, you can either file a new claim or you can appeal a decision that's less than a year old. Okay, thank you. Uh, this one is uh, advised by VSO to not file for all my conditions, to just file a few at a time. Is that the best advice? I don't want to get in the way between anyone's service officer or their or, or their own claims, but I, I my gut would be to file everything at once because you're looking at effective date at that time. I agree. The with A that. will give you effective dates from the day you file your claim, so you want that to be as soon as possible. Sure, and then you can always adjust your uh, appeal rating based on if even if you don't have symptoms or if it's filed and it's in the system at that rate that that date you can always adjust it later on if you need to increase a rating okay next one uh, health brother request copies of his records military records and service records in march uh haven't received anything the va representative working his claim asked for proof of exposure um unfortunately i know that the um the archives location, uh, if you go into the OPM and archives, they are highly inundated and backlogged, I know, since the pandemic started. Um, it's been accessing six months sometimes or longer to receive any records. And I think that would be the best way, uh, Michael, you might know different, to file a claim and request records in conjunction with that claim, I think is probably the fastest way to access records. Uh, if you just put in a simple request for records, it's, it's taking a long period of time. I know that. So yeah, there's just back, there's a backlog in the entire that, federal government. Yeah. System. And I, there's nothing we can do about that. Yeah. In this case, you know, if the veterans exposure is something that's, if it's consistent with the circumstances of the service, if it's a burn pit, VA is, Raiders should be accepting the statement as true if it's consistent with their statements of service. The veteran right. says, I was in Iraq. There was a burn pit on base. Contrary evidence, you know, notwithstanding, VA Raiders should be accepting that as a true statement. Good. So, and, and that's in regard to, especially if they have uh, health conditions that are chronic and, um, you know, preventing them from living quality of life to where they mm -hmm. should be treated, uh, would they be eligible for VA healthcare under those presumptive conditions, even if they didn't have those records? Uh, once they're service connected, you're in the VA medical system. Um, sure. Beyond that, trying to get in being non-service connected, I understand it can be difficult. I mean, it's a, okay. it's a again, getting access to VHA is the first step. Uh, if you can't do that, it's just hard to get access to that, um, to that level of care and priority groups, free health care. Um, I hope that answered the question. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so uh, we still have uh, 
few qu- quite a few questions. Uh, we'll try I, to get I can, to this. I can hang out for as long as you need. It's uh, okay, Michael. Sure. You're great. You know, you're a sport. Thank you. We appreciate you staying on. We have about 29. I'll, we'll try to go through these as quickly as we can and try and answer them as accurately and uh, as we can. So, this person uh, diagnosed with the VA, misdiagnosed by the VA, I'm sorry, um, chronic cough and need to clear my throat. VA first called it Gulf War syndrome. When they filed the claim 20 years later, it was diagnosed by the VA as an allergy and rated me at 0%. That looks like it may be, it looks like VA is granting the claim. Um, the issue for this veteran might be the rating. If the veteran disagrees with the rating, you know, you can dispute that. Say it should right. be higher. Or if there's other conditions that aren't being considered in that, you know, file new claims for those conditions. Okay. Hopefully that answered your question. Next one, burning oil wells in open ocean on the Gulf part of the burn pit. Not technically the same. Things like that um, get a little trickier because, again, the veteran statement must be consistent with the known circumstances of the situation. But generally speaking, VA treats different kinds of exposures differently. They have different chemical compositions, different particular mm-hmm. exposures. So it may or may not be treated the same. Just be aware of that. Uh, CPAP. Sleep apnea, is it considered apnea a presumptive? Sleep apnea has not been recognized as a presumptive Gulf War condition, no. Okay. Um, disability rating from the VA. Recalculate the entire rating if you submit an additional presumptive claim. Uh, I would hesitate to submit a new presumptive claim and have the VA reduce my current rating. Yeah, the total rating is based on all of the individual ratings being combined under like a, a special mathematical table. They don't just add the numbers together. Go mm-hmm. on to this. They combine them using a formula. There, if you have a legitimate claim that you think you know VA should be adjudicating, I will submit that. VA can reduce your rating, so you know you have to be aware that that can happen. But generally speaking, if your conditions have been stable, hasn't been much change, um, VA generally leaves things alone. If you come to V, my general experience is if you come to VA twice and your conditions have gotten better, that's when VA really starts to think about reducing the rating. If you come once and VA finds, well, you might be better, we're not going to do anything now, but you know, we did notice that. So it can happen, unfortunately. Uh, must a veteran use a service a representative to file PTSD or sleep apnea? Uh, I think we answered that earlier. We did already answer that. Um, no, you don't. Like you said, no, you do not have to, but it's recommended. So served in the Gulf War, was discharged in 92, uh, submitted claim for asthma and swelling. It was not approved. Uh, I still have breathing issues. Um, can I get benefits for the asthma all the way back to the first denial, if any? That is um, a tough road to hoe. Usually speaking, once a claim has been finalized the appeals have ended it's a final decision and veterans can't reach back to earlier final decisions sometimes you can but it has to be because va made some obvious egregious mistake that they should have granted the claim but absent that evidence you know usually earlier claims are foreclosed for effective dates you're stuck with the claim that you file at the time okay thank you for that question and the answer uh, recording of the webinar, we've already answered that. Yes, we will be having an, uh, in our chat, we will be having a link to our archived webinars uh, so that you can access this recording and you can also get the PDF and download the PDF of the slides in the chat. Thank you. Okay, um, this one received disability rating, short-term memory, Primary care, not the VA, has concluded the memory losses due to uh, GBS. Can we file a secondary condition claim for memory loss? Yes, it's just like the earlier question of fibromyalgia. Any secondary condition being caused by the service sure. condition can be granted separate service connection on a secondary basis. But that goes back to medical evidence. Okay. On the 4138, family member is providing a buddy letter. Do they sign it or does the veteran sign it at the bottom of the page? Typically, that's the family member. The person writing the statement should sign it. Okay. okay. A list of accredited service officers available to, for us to choose from. Um, you can access any county veteran service office on our website. You can look up 
1-800-VET-SERVE. Uh, you can filter out by county of California if you are in California, I must say. Um, if you're not in California and you're looking for another organization such as a VFW or American Legion or some other type of uh, DAV, you can probably just look them up online and find out how you can find one in your location in your region. Or you can email us and we can give you uh, information that way. Um, claim supporting letter did not use the VA form 214138. Will that be sufficient or would you recommend that I resubmit the statement on the 4138? Um, that would be up to you. I mean, if you if you have the time to do that and resubmit it, I would do that. Just because VA, they're hit relying so heavily on forms these days. If they may overlook something because it's not on a form. So if it's easy to do, I would probably send it in on 4138 again. Okay, can a veteran get back pay for a presumptive claim? Um, the again, we just explained, you know, once you have an earlier appeal that's died and like it's final, you typically can't reach back. Your effective date for your disability compensation, your benefits will be the day you filed the claim. That's a general rule. Going before that, it gets harder and harder, and generally the answer is no. It'll be from the day you filed your present claim. Okay, so a lot of these questions are keeping redundant on some things that we've already answered. This one, how, who are service officers and how do we find them? Uh, we have a link uh, in the chat for County Veteran Service Officers or also how to email us directly. And service officers are any accredited officer from the VA capable of filing a claim on your behalf. Um, the next one, how can a VA change a rating? Went to 100 to 80% due to change in PTSD. I think you've already addressed that. Yeah, the Congress allows it. You can dispute it. There are yeah. processes, you know, you have to, you can dispute it if you think it's wrong, but VA is allowed to reduce a veteran's rating, unfortunately. Okay. Um, that looks like an uh, earlier person cutting and pasting Marine decision. Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about individual rating decisions at this point in time. Okay, what's the length of time a person is needed to have been in the theater to benefit one, from one war. day one foot basically one foot yep. in theater from one day that's all you need excellent sleep apnea condition uh will not provide a nexus letter or option letter uh, you have to try it if, if you can you know try there's not much you can do at that point va doctors are, are loath to do that a lot of the times if you can provide find a private doctor who will probably want money to do it, you know, that is a, like something you can explore or just go to the CP examination and see what happens there. Okay. Uh, congestive heart failure, being cared for the VA, is this a go for link? It's not a presumptive condition, but again, if you can provide nexus evidence linking it, then, you know, that's a direct service reaction claim. Okay. Okay, if a presumptive claim is approved, is it retroactive to the date of the issue occurred? It's a uh, good date the, of claim. There you go. Okay, already 100% served in the first Gulf War, never did the Gulf War physical. Should I do the Gulf War physical and apply for the ratings, even though I already have these identified in my disability? If you're 100% rated, you know, you may walk to leaving it alone. But then again, there's SMCs, which can push your compensation above and beyond that. That's something you want to talk to a service officer about to see what are your chances for that. Right. That's a good point. Uh, denied Gulf War syndrome four years ago, never appealed. I'm 100% disabled. I think that's asked and answered. Mm -hmm. uh, where does ED fall in all this? ED Gastro is not. Sorry. Uh, sorry. No, go ahead. ED is not presumptive, but if it's secondary to a presumptive condition, it can be related that way. Um, yeah. Gastric functional disorder. Again, that's going to an individual claim. You know, what evidence do you have? Do you have that diagnosis? If you do, mm -hmm. VA should be granting that presumptively. If there's not, you know, there's some other detail in your case that is hanging it up. Okay. PTSD was combined with traumatic brain injury because they couldn't separate the two. Uh, granted 50% and then 10 for traumatic brain injury 10 years ago. Now 50 with residual TBI. Well, that's interesting because, you know, TBI science has come a long way in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And if you think your condition's worsening, or if you want to be to try to separate out the conditions for individual ratings from either one, you can consider filing uh, increased rating claims. 
Okay, we're, we've got 10 more uh, questions here, 11. Uh, we can whittle these down rather quickly. Thank you, Michael. We appreciate you staying on. Uh, and also all of our attendees, we appreciate your time too. So we know that your time is valuable. So if you want your questions answered, we appreciate you staying on. Uh, next one is uh, less than a month, uh, in and out. What exactly is a nexus letter? So again, uh, there's no time limit on being in the theater of operations. Mm -hmm. One foot on one day should suffice. Beyond, beyond that, the nexus letter again is a statement from a doctor or some other professional linking your present disability to service. Veterans can't offer their own nexus statements. That by just VA law and practice, they should be coming from medical professionals. Okay, excellent point. Um, how do you switch your VSO? My initial was not good. Initial one was not good. It's so, mean, yeah, Kirk, if I... yeah, there's a form, I believe. Um, I, I'm trying to remember this 2120 or something that you can actually use. Uh, if you send us an email with this, I can get you the document. We can send, and it's basically almost like a it, it's a form of uh, providing the information for letting them become your advocate and provide your claim. 2122, thank you. <laughs> brain fog. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so hopefully uh, you can get that form and you can switch your VSO to that. Currently rated at 50% PTSD. Okay, I don't know, under, we'll know what, what question you're asking about the PTSD. Is it Gulf War related or is it a presumptive condition? Um, what is the length of time a person need to have been in this theater? We've already addressed that. Uh, where does vertigo fall under? It's not a presumptive condition. It can be a symptom of something. It could be an undiagnosed illness, if you can establish that through the presumption, or it could be in a symptom of some other muckamy, or it can be just a direct service connection thing. It depends on what the facts of the case are. Okay, next question was he filed this initial claim on his own and the diagnosed with major depression disorder. Um, San Diego, can I appeal to include all of my presumptive for diagnosis or individual? Uh, well, it depends on what you want. I mean, if you have separate yeah. conditions, which weren't part of the original claim, those would be new claims. If you want to appeal the rating, that will be a dispute about the rating. It depends on the facts of your case. Like what new conditions are you trying to add? If it's a new claim, VA will treat that as a new claim. It won't be. It won't go be tied with the earlier one. Okay. A lot so of these are individual. Yeah. Individual. Yeah, it's difficult are, to answer those without like knowing the details of the case. Yeah. And again, unfortunately, sleep apnea is not a presumptive condition, even though there is, you know, some evidence showing links to PTSD or to exposure to service. But scientists right. and doctors are really hesitant on that. I'm finding. Headaches okay. could be part of Gulf War syndrome. Um, depends on the diagnosis. It can be, uh, can be a UDX or, or can be a MUCMI or go direct service connection. If you have headaches since the day you've been in service, then that could be a direct service connection claim. But generally okay. speaking, headaches by themselves are not presumptive. Okay. Sleep disorder for PTSD. Now they have sleep disorder for Gulf War. Well, depends. sleep disorder can be its own separate medical psychiatric diagnosis. Um, you can be service connected for that, but generally speaking, veterans only receive one rating for every mental disability that they're service connected for. VA combines all the symptoms to one giant rating. So if your PTSD already includes a sleep disorder, it's really no additional benefit to filing the claim. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... Uh, 87 year old hearing loss reduced rate. that's difficult that's that's difficult those are hard you know these older veterans especially relying on that money right you can all you can do is appeal take that to the board i would argue you know that there's certain steps you know where there's tell the board you know the veterans rating doesn't show an actual improvement in his life that's probably your best chance with that okay um, removal of gallbladder. As it depends on why it was removed. What, right. What's the underlying diagnosis? But maybe it could be. Okay. 
Our VA doctor is allowed to provide a nexus letter. I've tried to get a nexus from a doctor and was denied. Uh, they can, but it depends on whether or not they want to do it. Again, that's um, many don't want to get involved with V. There's VHA and VBA. Doctors in VHA don't want to get involved VBA. So a lot of them say no. Mm -hmm. um, the best thing you do is, you know, just take your chances with the CP examination, see what the right. doctor says there, or pay for a private opinion. And like you said, you know, if you're, if you're going to get that information from, I understand they want that diagnosis from their doctor stating, Hey, this is, you know, combined and connected to your time when you were in that, that theater. So they want that so that they can file the claim without, you know, but I agree. Uh, GERD. This, um, looking at this quickly, a high level review, it's possible if you just want to say that the examination is inadequate. Say the examiner ignored the fact that I had symptoms in service. If the examiner did not mention the in service symptoms, they should have. If they didn't, that's a higher level review issue because it's an inadequate examination. But if the doctor did talk about them, they need to find more evidence. You know, more, what more lay statements can you provide? Was the veteran taking Tums? Can the veteran's wife attest to that? Things like that, you know, hmm. to send in to VA with a supplemental claim. You need more evidence. Okay. Skin conditions uh, prior to 9 11 deployment, is that a con presumptive condition? Um, it's not a presumptive condition. That's a tough one. It'll probably be a direct service section argument or some kind of undiagnosed illness. But then if you're trying to definitely get back to this vaccine, that's probably a direct service section argument. You need a doctor backing up the argument. Okay. Gastrointestinal problems linked to anthrax vaccine. I'll admit that I don't know. That's not something I've studied, so I can't answer that. But if it has, then that could be a direct service section argument. All right. The knee brace surgery, active duty, uh, minimum rating with 10% for the SCAR alone. Can you get in a higher rating? Well, you could have filed another claim, especially yeah. if you're having conditions that are aggravated now. Yeah. I mean, if it's a, if any time service connected condition is getting worse, you can file an increased rating claim. I mean, that's just a, it's, that's not controversial. But it depends on you know, whether or not you think your symptoms are getting worse. Okay. Okay. Now, I think there was a couple in the chat. Um, Alyssa, did you get any of those answered in the chat as well? I'm not sure if uh, they were any stragglers in there. So if you did have a question and we didn't get to it, it was in the chat, uh, please put it in the Q&A and we can address it. If not, uh, that's all the questions. So it's hard to itemize some of the questions if you put it in the chat. So that's why we asked if you put it in the Q&A. Denied claims under appeal, uh, canceled, add supplemental information. That, that's a valid strategy. I mean, as long as you're trying to preserve your effective date. If you cancel the appeal and lose the earlier effective date, then that's probably a bad strategy. But if you're still within that one-year period of previous decision, then mm -hmm. you can change lanes of your, of your dispute. So yeah, you can definitely do that. Okay. Uh, next one is uh, Israel. They were in Israel. Does that count as the Southwest Theater? Uh, Israel, unfortunately, uh, let me double check here. Israel is not on the map. It is not part of the Southwest Asia Theater operation. Just probably because, you know, different environmental factors. They don't have open bird pits. They don't have right. any other issues that the other countries are dealing with. Okay, um, we've gone over time and we've answered all the questions that were in the Q&A. If you have any questions uh, related to this going forward, please reach out. Here's the contact information. You can reach any one of us and we can direct it to the appropriate person to get you the answers that you need. Myself, Ben, uh, or Paul Sullivan at this email here if you have questions. Uh, with that being said, I would like to inform you that we do have some upcoming webinars on this topic for burn pit exposure, uh, but we also have some VR&E employment uh, webinars coming up uh, as well, and service and separation and employment claims and appeals, uh, as you can see here coming up in November. Um, please look on our website for future webinars and uh, our Eventbrite page. And we also ask that you would take the time to fill out the survey uh, 
on in the chat. Uh, we do take that information and the feedback very, very seriously. Uh, we want to tailor our webinars to direct it to the information that you are, you are desiring. So the survey is a huge way for us to gauge that need on your end. So uh, please take that survey. It's valuable to us. And with that being said, I want to thank you all for your time. I want to thank our presenters. Thank you, uh, Mr. Garza, for the time that you've answered all the questions. Thank you, Ben, for the time. And I want to thank Alyssa. She's been handling the chat and the questions and the Q&A on the back end. Uh, she normally doesn't do that. So uh, thank you, Alyssa, for filling in. And we want to thank you all for your service. So we, uh, uh, we know we've gone over today, but there's a lot of valuable information. Uh, if you have any more future questions, please direct them to our email or any one of us, and we will get back to you as well. Uh, thank you all for your time. Have a wonderful day going forward. We hope to see you again soon. Bye, everybody.